Grace to you and peace from God our Creator and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Forgive me. Normally it takes a couple of seconds, but Madeline's getting the video camera going. And I was just envisioning myself making silly faces into the camera while she was getting it started. Sure glad I didn't do that. Some time ago, I performed a funeral at a local cemetery, and I happened to notice one of the tombstones nearby. And it had the usual curriculum vitae, it had the person's name, and the year born, and the year died. But below that was the phrase, he made a difference. And that always struck me. Because in all I've done over my years as a professional, whether it's from the pulpit, on the decks of a Navy ship, in the fighting hall of a battlefield, or the battlefield of a classroom, that has been my burning desire. To make a difference. To be an influence on the lives of other people. And my motivation for doing that is not that I'm so wonderful that I think everybody should be like me. You know, I mean, you know, I'm just marvelous. And if the whole world was like me, it'd be a better place. <laughs> well, actually, it would. But that's beside the point. <laughs> the reason I seek to influence others is to share with them the difference that God has made in me. To let others experience the love of God the way I have. To let others see what it means to say, Jesus is my Lord. And my relationship with God is based on the loving things he did for me. Now it's our turn. Our text for this morning is a portion of our gospel lesson from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, where Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but it's thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. You are the salt of the earth. It's a familiar expression. We usually refuse it to refer to somebody who is very solid and has a strong background. But let's take a look at what Jesus was meaning by this. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us his Beatitudes, the qualities of being blessed. And it's not the way you would anticipate. He doesn't say blessed are the wealthy because they have money to spend. Blessed are those who are powerful, for they can make anything happen they want. No. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the humble. Because those are the people, rather than boasting about themselves, will look to God and receive his blessings. And so it is for us that we are called to take those blessings and make a difference in the lives of other people. In ancient times, salt was viewed as a necessity of life. Because of its seasoning and preservative qualities, it was one of the most highly prized of all minerals. In many societies, it was so highly valued that it was used as money. The Latin word salarium for salt 
is the word that we have adapted for the English word salary. Because Roman soldiers were paid not with currency, but with salt. Salt was used as a preservative to keep food from spoiling. Good things had not yet come to life through General Electric. <laughs> and so you couldn't take your food that you bought in the market and refrigerate it. But you can't keep running to the market every day. So you try to get the food you bought to last just a little bit longer. And that was the value of salt. Whenever a city was defeated, it was customary to throw salt throughout the city, symbolizing that the history of this city has been broken and the past is left in the past. A new history is beginning. 2 Kings 2 tells us how Elisha used salt to purify the water of Jericho. And it was normal procedures for a child born in those days to have salt rubbed over its body to protect it against demonic influences. Salt was gathered along the lake shores and by the sea. It was used for seasoning. Now, whose burger doesn't taste better <laughs> when it's got salt on it? Now, my doctor tells me that I need to cut down on my sodium intake because I have high blood pressure. I don't think my doctor realizes what eating bland, tasteless food does to my blood pressure. I want a burger that tastes like a burger. <laughs> And you can season it with other things, but it's just not the same. <laughs> and it doesn't take much. Just a little pinch of salt is enough to season an entire whopper. Such is the value that we have in being able to influence other people. According to Leviticus 2 and Ezekiel 43, Salt was also used to flavor offerings and sacrifices to God, to purify them. Fast forward to the New Testament, and Paul writes to the Romans and says, we should present ourselves to God as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to Him, not conforming ourselves to the ways of the world, but since we have to live in the world, being transformed in our mind by the Holy Spirit. Salt is about friendship. Salt is about a covenant relationship. You are the salt of the earth. It only takes a little bit to season a meal, and it only takes a little bit to season a community or a neighborhood. I bet you every one of you can think of somebody in your neighborhood who has influenced the entire community. Growing up in New York, it was my neighbor Rocky. No relation to the guy from Philadelphia. Rocky was a wonderful man. And everybody knew him. Everybody considered Rocky to be their best friend. He was just a nice guy. I suppose instead of calling him Rocky, they should have called him Salty. <laughs> now we can't deny the function of salt. Nor can we deny that we are the light of the world. Once again, GE had not yet brought good things to light. <laughs> so you could not walk into your first century home, flip the switch, and have a light come on. It was typically a one-room home with some short three-foot-high walls that separated the eating area from the relaxing area from the sleeping area. And one pedestal in the middle of the room. They didn't have candles the way we do. So they would take a bowl filled with oil and put a wick into it. 
light it. And that would give light to the entire house. But what if you're leaving for the day to go work? It's difficult to get that thing relit so the folks would leave the lamp burning. But you don't want to run the risk of fire. So you take your lamp, you put it in a corner, and you cover it with a clay pot that has a hole in the top. This way, the fire danger is removed, but the lamp can stay lit. And then when you come home from work, you take off the covering, and you put the lamp back on the pedestal. So once again, it gives light to the entire house. You are the light of the world. Yet so many Christians keep that basket over them and don't let anyone see their light. Now the curious thing about salt and light, to be salt, you're seasoning the lights of other people. You're affecting them. But to be light, you don't have to do anything except be yourself and let other people see you. But here is the most fascinating thing of all for me. In a couple of days, we're going to be marking the full moon. But the moon doesn't shine. We talk about it. We sing about it. Shine on, shine on, harvest moon. The moon doesn't shine. The moon only reflects the light of the sun. I'm sorry, but you guys have no luminescence all your own. <laughs> None of you is capable of shining on your own merit. But what every one of us can do is reflect the light of the Son of God. And let others see our light. The verse from our Gospel lesson is included in our baptismal ceremonies. We take the light from that candle behind me, the one we call the Christ candle. We use it to light an individual candle given to the person being baptized. And we quote the Bible from our gospel lesson, let your light so shine before others that they may see the good things you do and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Adler and I are not going to be going to Switzerland in the next week or so. Maybe someday we will. But if we do, there's a church there I want to see. It's up on the top of a hill. And even today, it has no electricity. So when the people come for the morning service, there is the light that comes through the windows. Uh, but what do you do about the Sunday night service? Sister Nancy just goes to show you, there are Lutherans who worship on Sunday night too. <laughs> the people would bring their lanterns and use that to walk up the path to the church. And when they went into the church, they would hang their lantern on hooks that were placed along the wall. If only a couple of people showed up, the church was pretty dark. But if a lot of Christians showed up and brought their light with them, the place beamed with light. And the people in town could look up at the church and see that it was ablaze with light. And then at the end of the service, when the skies had gotten dark, you could watch that church as it emptied and see a stream of light coming out of the church and going back out into the village. My prayer is that we could be that church. For you are the light of the world. And you take that light with you when you leave here today. So that people will see your light. And give glory to your Father who is in heaven. May the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. To worship God with our own.